Hello, my name's Phil Taylor, and in this instructional video, I'm going to show you how to isolate pathogens from plants. Of course, only necrotic fungi, oomycetes and bacteria can be isolated and taken into culture. The obligate pathogens cannot be cultured in the laboratory and cannot be isolated. So this rules out the rusts, the smuts, the powdery mildews, the downy mildews, and of course the fastidious bacteria. Similarly, there's no chance of isolating and culturing viruses. Before you attempt to isolate a fungal or a bacterial pathogen, you need to be fairly sure that the symptoms are caused by a pathogen. Sometimes insect feeding can look like an infection and there are plenty of abiotic problems plants can face which can induce pathogen-like symptoms. But of course, there's no pathogen to isolate because the problem is temperature or wind or nutrients, sun scorch, drought, water logging, or maybe herbicide damage. It can be difficult to eliminate all these other issues before you embark on isolating a pathogen. And to some extent, that may be why you're attempting to isolate the pathogen anyway. But where possible, you should make sure that the problem is microbial. The surface of even a healthy plant is covered with fungi and bacteria, and the numbers are far greater on a diseased plant. On a diseased area of a plant, almost all the microbes will be opportunists. They are feasting on the nutrients that are released from the dead or dying plant tissue. Pathogens generally do not compete well with the opportunists, and unless they can constantly migrate into new tissue, they will die and be outcompeted with the fungi and bacteria more suited to growing quickly in the relatively rich nutrient environment. The pathogen is normally located near the site of symptoms, but there are exceptions. Wilt-inducing pathogens are an obvious example. The wilt is usually seen in the upper leaves, but the pathogen will be infecting at the base of the plant. To isolate the pathogen, we need to kill off most or all of these opportunists before attempting to culture the pathogen. And we do this by immersing the material in dilute bleach for a few minutes and then washing the bleach off. And this is something I'm going to show you in going forward now. So I'm going to show you how to isolate fungi and bacteria from diseased plant tissue. Now it's very important to select your symptoms correctly. You don't really want to have something like this. This is far too dead. The tissue is completely overrun with uh, saprobes uh, feasting on the dead tissue. The pathogen will be there um, in very short supply, or possibly not even there at all. So when it's completely dead, this isn't the tissue you want. What you want to find is you want to find some very new symptoms which are just developing. Here we have some, uh, some little leaf spots just developing on this leaf. Um, and this is the kind of area that you want to take the, the samples from, because this is where the pathogen will be growing most actively and where the pathogen won't be overrun by saprophytic organisms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of this uh, leaf tissue, put it into dilute bleach, wash the bleach off, and then put it onto tap water agar. And I'll show you how to do that now. Before we start uh, cutting up the leaf or getting out the, the bleach, it's a good idea just to, to rub down the area with a bit of alcohol, just to make sure that you're not contaminating your, um, your sample with uh, any microorganisms that were around before. So I'm just gonna clean down the area with a bit of alcohol, just to make sure um, there's nothing, nothing there, nothing alive. Okay, so I'm gonna get my, my leaf sample here. And as I said, I'm going to cut it up into small pieces and put those pieces into dilute bleach. The bleach I'm going to use is between 1 and 1.5% active chlorine. Now, depending on the stock of chlorine that you buy, you might have to dilute it to different amounts. Now, we buy a 4.5% chlorine solution, so we dilute it about 1 plus 3 or something like that. And here's a, uh, a sample which I've diluted. And you should be able to smell the chlorine. You should be able to smell the chlorine on the coming off the off the surface of the liquid. It shouldn't knock you back. If it knocks you back, it's too far too concentrated, but it should be detectable. So we can put some of the, the dilute bleach into, uh, into a small dish, um, and we're going to cut up some pieces of the, uh, of the leaf tissue and put it into uh, the bleach. Now, we don't have to be too sterile at this point because everything's gonna go into the bleach to be sterilized. But what we do need to do is to cut up um, the leaf with the symptoms on into small pieces, approximately five millimeters by one millimeter or five millimeters by two millimeters is the ideal size, but it doesn't really matter. As I said, you want to take it from the edge of the, uh, of the symptoms so that uh, you've got the area where the, 
the pathogen is growing actively and the saprophytic organisms haven't yet begun to take over. So uh, here's a few little pieces here. So here they are. You can see they've tried to take the edge of the, of the leaf uh, spots. There's another one here, which I'm going to try and... That's quite a nice one, taking the edge of the, the leaf spot like that. So, once we've got these little pieces of, of, uh, of leaf with, uh, with symptoms on and not symptoms on, so just health, the border between the healthy and the diseased, we're going to transfer them to the dilute bleach. Here's the dilute bleach. Just pop them across and I'm going to uh, time it to be about one minute uh, in the bleach. So put them all in as quickly as you can and then time it for one minute. You might want to do this for one minute, two minutes and three minutes before you wash the bleach off. So I'm going to just set the timer so just to, so we're going to be going for one minute in this instance. The idea of course is to, is to kill off the saprophytic organisms, the microorganisms which are opportunists growing on the dead tissue whilst keeping the pathogen alive. And we can imagine that the, uh, the saprobes will be on the surface whereas the pathogen will be more deeper in within the tissue and hopefully it'll take longer for the bleach to percolate down inside the tissue and so the pathogen won't die whereas we will kill off many of the saprobes around the edge. So after one minute we're going to we're going to wash off the bleach um, in, in two washes of, uh, of sterile distilled water and I've got two little bottles here and uh, so to one minute we're going to move them across. But of course, now, after this point, everything has to be sterile, or as sterile as can be, because we're trying to prevent any contamination coming in from outside. So just flaming my uh, forceps quickly, and then loosening the top of the, uh, of the sterile distilled water bottles, and then quickly transfer them across to, uh, to the rinse off the, the surface of the bleach, so rinse the bleach from the from the leaf samples. So there we have it. And as I said, it's a it's a balancing act between killing off the opportunist microorganisms on the surface of the leaf whilst keeping the pathogen alive. And as I said, between one, two, or three minutes would be about the right length of time. So that's one wash. I'm just going to transfer it across into into the second one now to. Uh, to make sure that all of the uh, all of the chlorine has been washed off to, to give the pathogen a good opportunity to grow on the surface of the tap water agar. So, as I said, you want to uh, do it for one, two, or three minutes. So that's got it washed twice. Hopefully, all the chlorine has gone, and hopefully, the pathogen is still alive. So. I'm just going to sterilize my forceps. I'm going to get a tap water agar plate. Very important to, uh, to label it. I'm going to label it with today's date, which is the 15th, 11th, 22. It's come from tomato, X tomato. I'm going to give uh, uh, my initials and I'm going to say what the media is, which is tap water agar or TWA. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, move the little pieces of tissue across onto this tap water agar. The tap water agar is a, an extremely low nutrient uh, medium on which to grow uh, fungi and so any of the nutrients coming that the fungus can grow on will have come from the leaf tissue. So you get very sparse fungal growth on the surface of this medium, which is exactly what we want. What we don't want to do is provide a great deal of nutrients for the fungus, any fungi, which will then grow rapidly across. So as you can see, we've got three pieces of, uh, of leaf tissue uh, evenly spaced out on the surface of the tap water agar. As I said, it's very important to use tap water agar. And 
what I set up a few days ago, I think five days ago, was I did exactly the same thing, and I've got some plates here to show you what the, what the result is, and that's here. So this was set up a few days ago, and pieces of, uh, of tomato uh, leaf on the surface of the tap water agar, and the colonies that have grown out from it are, if I just draw it approximately with this pen, I can show you where the uh, where the colonies are, possibly a little further on that one out like that, just think like that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cut out some of this uh, agar and transfer it to a richer media. If you'd put it on the rich medium right from the beginning, you'd have got an extremely large amount of luxuriant fungal growth, which isn't what you wanted. Okay, so if you put it onto a very rich medium, the sap probes will grow very rapidly and the fungus will be at a disadvantage. So we want to make life tough for the fungus, so it has to grow only using the nutrients which are coming out of the, the plant material. So this is what you want, and this is what you don't want, because there's too much fungus here, and it's likely that the pathogen will have been overrun with another fungus. So at this point, you need to uh, select uh, a medium, which is a richer media. This is PCA medium, potato, carrot, agar, and uh, this is um, very suitable for growing fungi on. So I'm going, I'm going to cut out a small amount of the agar from the TWA plate and transfer it across to the PCA plate. So take a not too close to the, to the uh, leaf sample, out where the fungi, the hyphae are growing, quite isolated, and transfer it across as quickly as you can, just so that uh, you can see um, the little bit of agar on the surface with the fungal hyphae on it, and that will grow out onto the potato agar. Potato, in this case, potato dextrose agar. Um, when you have transferred it, you don't want to stress the fungus too much, so just leave it under normal room conditions, ambient temperature. But then after a few days, once the fungus has become established on the medium, you want to transfer this to um, an alternating 12 hours of ultraviolet light, 12 hours of visible light, on and off, because this will induce sporulation within the fungus. And what you want is you want the fungus to sporulate because once you can see the spores, it will then be possible to identify which fungus it is that you've isolated. So if you have more than one fungus growing out from, a leaf, uh, from your leaf pieces, you might do well to take them all. The rapidly growing ones are more likely to be contaminants and the slow growing one is more likely to be the pathogen. Transfer it across onto a medium, potato dextrose agar, potato carrot agar, leave it for a few days, then put it under ultraviolet light, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, in order to induce sporulation. And then, once you've got the spores to be produced, then you can have a look to see what spores they are and hopefully identify which fungus it is you've isolated. So if you suspect a bacterial pathogen and you want to isolate the bacteria from the leaf spot, use a similar procedure, but you, of course you don't use the, the bleaching step um, because that will kill the bacteria too. So I'm going to show you what to do. You, you get a leaf and again you want uh, symptoms which are fresh, young and still rapidly expanding. I've got a leaf here with uh, uh, some leaf spots on and uh, what we're going to do, well first of all we're going to just, um, just quickly swab the, the tile uh, with alcohol to make sure we're not picking up any bacteria from the environment. So we're going to Swab the, swab the tile, try, and, uh, don't, try not to handle the leaf uh, as much as possible. So, but we're going to have a, to select a leaf spot. Now here's a, a reasonable leaf spot here. We're going to take a small amount of tissue from it. So, so I'm going to just sterilize my scalpel because there isn't a sterilization step in this isolation. So we want to keep things as sterile as possible. So we're going to take a little bit of tissue from this, uh, from this leaf. Here I am, again, from the edge of the leaf spot. This is where the, the bacterial numbers will be at their maximum. So, and now I'm going to transfer this to some sterile distilled water. So 
little jar of sterile distilled water, a little universal, put it into a sterile Petri dish. And I'm going to transfer this material across into the sterile distilled water. Once it's in the sterile distilled water, you then have to break up the tissue in order to try and uh, uh, release the bacteria as much as possible. So, uh, taking the sterile dish, of course it's uh, got the bacteria in it, I'm going to use the, uh, the end of a mounted needle, which I'm going to sterilize, and then just um, break up the tissue by crushing it against the, the bottom of the uh, Petri dish like this. So just crushing it like this, making it a, uh, into a almost like a, a bacterial soup where the bacteria are released as the material is crushed and they're released into the water. So, uh, so once you've got this uh, crushed material like this, you then have to take a small amount of it and um, plate it out onto nutrient agar. We're not using uh, tap water agar this time, we're using nutrient agar, because we're not transferring any of the leaf material across onto the plate, we're just transferring uh, this sterile distilled water into which the bacteria have been released. And we're going to do this with an ordinary conventional uh, microbiology um, loop, which I've just sterilized. And I'm just going to cool it down in the agar so I don't kill the, kill the bacteria as I transfer them across. So just to get a, a loop full of the bacteria like this, transfer them to the plate and then sterilize the loop again. Now this is very straightforward standard microbiology process of streaking a plate. So we put in one streak, cooling the cooling the loop, streaking the plate again, sterilizing it, just turning the loop round, turn the plate round, st sterilizing it again, turning it round, cooling the loop, ster uh, then final streak and then down into the center of the, of the plate like that. So what we've done, we've taken this bacterial soup and we've spread it over the surface of the, of the agar. Millions of bacteria in one, hundreds of thousands in the next, getting down, hopefully, to single colonies in the center of the plate. And so what I've done, I've got one here to show you, which I did a, a, a few days ago. And you can see the, uh, uh, the bacteria growing on the surface of the agar um, quite nicely. And this plate has worked quite well because you can see the initial streak over here was diluted, diluted, diluted until ultimately we've got these single colonies down in the center of the plate. So that's, that's what you're hoping for when you're isolating bacteria. Now, you might get a population of bacteria when you, when you do this. So a mixture and you might want to know which is the, which is the, uh, the pathogen, if it is a pathogen at all. And of course, the most abundant one would be the pathogen. Now, you, how could you say which is the most abundant one? You can redo the whole process again, but rather than taking uh, a leaf spot from the leaf, take a healthy area of the leaf, repeat the whole process, and you should find far fewer bacteria on the surface of the leaf uh, where there wasn't a leaf spot compared to where there was. So this is an indication that the leaf spot is caused by a bacterial pathogen. So at this point, we've moved the little agar blocks off onto our fresh plates, and now it's time to seal them up and uh, incubate them, hoping to get sporulation. So I'm just going to tape them up. This will help to keep mites out, stop mites from migrating from one plate to another. It will also stop the lids from falling off, stop them getting mixed up as well. So just uh, a bit of insulating tape, you can, or possibly Nesco film, which will just seal them up stops them from drying out and it makes them a more sealed, rather nice little unit for the fungi to grow in. So uh, wrap them up like this and then once you've got them all sealed up nicely, 
you then transfer them onto a tray, which I'll show you in a moment, which is lined with aluminium foil. So I've got one here. This is the tray, the tray that we use. I'm going to put the sealed up plates on the tray like this. And the tape will stop the, the mites from moving from one plate to another. But in case there are any mites around, you don't want them moving from this area to another. Now we've been using a plant material here today, so we want to try and make sure that there are no mites that have fallen off and got into our fungal cultures. So I'm using a bit of Vaseline here just to uh, prevent the mites from wandering from one plate to an, one tray to another. So this, this barrier of Vaseline all the way around the edge will stop the mites wandering off and contaminating any other plates. So if there are mites here, they've, they've got to, uh, first of all, get out of the plate through the tape, then they've got to get off this tray, which they'll find very difficult to do. So let the plates sit under ambient conditions, just natural daylight for a few days to let the fungus get established, and then we transfer it across to the ultraviolet light to induce sporulation. So this is our ultraviolet light setup, and this is where we get the fungi to sporulate. And these are the plates which we've just subbed on, but we're not going to leave those under the ultraviolet light just at the moment because it might damage them and kill them. So we're going to leave them in ambient conditions for a few days before they get transferred here. <clears throat> but what I do have, we have some plates here which have been under ultraviolet light for a few days, and you can see that there are, they're beginning to sporulate, they're sporulating quite nicely. Um, again, these are samples which have come from, from tomato, so two sporulating rather nicely. Um, a <clears throat> third one beginning to sporulate here, uh, and these two yet, they're not sporulating just yet. So they might require a few more days to get them to sporulate. But by having this setup of 12 hours of ultraviolet light and 12 hours not ultraviolet light, um, it induces sporulation within the fungi. And that's what you want. You want sporulation because once you've got the spores, you can then identify which fungus it is that you're looking at. We have a mixture of ultraviolet and visible light coming on for 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Uh, but it's the ultraviolet light that's the particularly the important one to induce that sporulation within the fungus.